for ah. Victoria University of Wellington. That's why I was struggling. I read over this as well before. She is the author of Vocabulary and ESP Research. That's 2018 Routledge. The co-author of Academic Vocabulary for Middle School Students, Research-Based Lists, and Strategies for Key Content Areas. That's 2015 Brooks. And developed the Academic Word List. That's Coxhead 2000. So over to you. Thank you very much. So kia ora koura, it's April Coxhead here. And uh, as I said before, I'm, I'm sitting in my office, I've got the fire on and a very happy cat sitting next to me. So the, the purpose of today's talk is to think about vocabulary in speaking in English for academic purposes. And one of the reasons why I've started to get more interested in speaking and listening in particular is that there isn't really uh, so much focus in vocabulary studies on the um, on the vocabulary that learners are listening to, but also the vocabulary that they're producing in, in their spoken language. So today what I'm going to be doing is talking, mm, it's not moving on, actually I can do that, sorry folks, do this, okay. So what I've got for you today is three studies about spoken academic English, and I have to say that I have been very selective in what I've done today because I wanted to uh, talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing at our university, at Victoria University of Wellington, and uh, looking to see how, the, how this research could, be, could play out in other contexts as well. And I thought you might be interested in it. So what we're going to do is start with each of these three studies, and then I'm going to be going into looking at how this research might inform our teaching and our approaches to learning and working with materials in classes. So I'm going to be talking now for about mm, 35 minutes or so, and um, I'm hoping to have plenty of time at the end uh, for you to ask questions, and, and that'll happen, as Simon said, through, through his capable hands. So what I wanted to start with today is some key ideas, and I've put them on the screen in front of you. So the first three really relate closely to each other. So this idea of 95% and 98%. What we have there are, um, is a central idea around how many word families do learners need to know to comprehend what they're listening to or comprehend what they're reading. So the main difference between 95% and 98% is that 95% is clearly lower, right? But at 95%, learners should be able to comprehend, but they're going to need some help. So they don't have quite enough vocabulary to be able to be working with texts on their own. At 98%, the research that's looked at uh, vocabulary and comprehension around 98% shows that if the learners know 98% of the vocabulary which is in what they're listening to or in what they're reading to, they should reading, then they should be able to cope with it. So again, 95% help me, 98% I should be okay. Now the idea of lexical coverage is I think really helpful if you think about word lists like the academic word list for example then when we talk about lexical coverage what we're saying there is what percentage of this text does a word list cover so if you take the academic word list for example in the work that I did quite a few years ago the coverage was around 10% of academic university level texts now, lexical coverage, you can see, relates to 95 and 98%, and that what we're talking about with the 95 and the 98% is saying, in general, how many word families, and we know this through word frequency lists by Paul, Professor Paul Nation, which, by the way, any time you want to find out anything about vocabulary, just search his name and look at his website. It's amazing. Now, the last point there on your slide is about word families. And the whole idea with word families is to think about words not as single words, but thinking about them as a group. So a word family, for example, of a word like analyze includes analyze, analyze past tense, um, analysis as the noun, analyzing, for example, and, and so on. So we're building a bigger unit of counting than just one single word. Now, the reason why word families are important is that they get used in lexical coverage and around these 95% and 98%. So what we're talking about here is word families in these calculations. Okay, so I would give you a test, but I'm not going to. Instead, I'm going to talk about study number one. 
So study number one was a study of teacher talk in secondary classrooms. And the reason why I decided to get involved in this kind of work is I was really interested in what it is that teachers are talking about the vocabulary that they're using in their classes because it's a major, for, for some students, it's, it, teacher talk is a particularly important form of input. And I often see um, examples of uh, teachers marking students' spoken performance by saying, oh, what kind of vocabulary do, do these students use in their writing? Ha, ah, sorry, what kind of vocabulary do they use in their speaking? And that caused me to stop and think, well, what kind of vocabulary are teachers using when they are speaking? So there was a study by Marlisa Horst in Canada, and you might have read some of her work. It's always worth reading what Marlisa um, writes. She's just published a new book on vocabulary for um, younger learners in particular in schools. And what Marlisa Horst found in her research on what vocabulary teachers are using in their speaking is that actually over 50% of the teacher talk that she had was teachers talking, doing things with, around classroom management. So, you know, sit down, shut up, open your book, close your book, um, and this kind of work in an ESL classroom. Not particularly much of what the teacher was talking about centered around language itself, and maybe around 30 or 40% was on vocabulary. So we've got, we need to find out more about the functions of what teachers are saying, as well as the vocabulary and what they're using. Now, I think this quote by Gibbons, Pauline Gibbons, and fantastic researcher based in Australia, she, she talks about why teacher talk is important. She says, the talk of teachers and students draws together or bridges the everyday language of students learning through English as a second language and the language associated with the academic registers of school, which they must learn to control. So one of the reasons why I wanted to do this research looking at teacher talk in secondary classrooms is I was thinking, well, what is it that our learners are um, listening to? What kind of bridging do we have with this idea of everyday language? And um, what can our vocabulary research tell us about this particular context where we're looking at three teachers? Now, the thing I love about teachers is that sometimes you can say to them, I'm actually going to ask to record you, and is that okay? And they'll say, yep, that's okay. And I say, really? For a week? And they go, yep, for a week. Like, that's fantastic. And can we do that three times in a year? I'm like, yeah, you can do that. So that's, we've got these three teachers who've been, who were based in an international school in Germany. And I think this is particularly important too, because we don't see much research in international schools, so this whole medium, English medium context. So what we did is we had, we had a, a math teacher, a science teacher, and an English as an additional language teacher. And these folks, fine and faithful souls that they were, put a microphone on themselves and recorded themselves teaching in week one of the year, in the main middle week of the year, and then at the end of the year. And what we were doing was recording and then transcribing, and we were looking to see what vocabulary gets used. Now, one of the key questions that we asked in this particular research was, if, we, if we're talking about lexical coverage, then how many word families do our learners need to know if they know 95% of the words in the text and 98%? And I'm going to show you some data. So here we go. So what this data tells you is in the top line, you've got the three subject areas, right? EAL, English as additional language, maths, and science. And you can see at 95%, remember 95% mean, means um, I can do it, but I need a bit of help. What you see is that the, these subjects are all roughly the same. So 2,000 EAL, 2,000 for maths, and 3,000 for science. Now, if you have a think about your students who are beginners or really don't know very much English, they probably don't know 2,000 words of English. So that what this data tells us is that to understand these classes, in secondary school in an English medium institution in Germany, these students actually need to know a lot of words, they need to be able to recognize a lot of words. Now, the major gap here is between the 95% and the 98%. And that gap is biggest in science. See how it goes from 3,000 to 7,000. Right? So what that's telling us, and this should be no surprise, but in maths and science, you need a bigger vocabulary at that 98% than you do in a class which is predominantly dealing with trying to help English for an additional language student to get up to speed so that they can deal with their subject better. I hope that that makes sense. Now, 
if we think about how many word families people need for general spoken English, so this has nothing to do with academic purposes whatsoever, then for general spoken discourse at 95%, you need around 3,000 words. So what we're seeing there is that actually these classrooms are fairly similar to just general spoken English. And I think that I'll show you a bit more soon to tell you a bit more about that too. Now, what about academic English at university? Well, for lectures, for 95%, you need about 4,000 word families. And that's research done by Ian Dang, who's now at Leeds University, and Stuart Webb, who's at Western University. So the reason why I'm telling you about these thousands and thousands of words is I want to draw your attention to the kind of vocabulary demands of spoken language in the classroom. Now, in this study, we didn't gather what the students were saying. We were gathering what the teachers were saying. And we really wanted to make it subject specific because I don't know if you, you teach in schools or if you, you remember vividly being in school, but one thing I remember from school is bouncing from one class to another class. So you might have a math class followed by an English class followed by a science class. And, and you've got lots of different language coming at you. So these, I think this study shows us about the demands in this particular context. So one of the things that we could be doing in our own research is in our own classrooms is being mindful of what we're trying to do when we're talking and hopefully above all what we're trying to do is, is to have a conversation with people about that what they're learning and not trying to make it so difficult that they just don't understand so we've got to think about what our students are doing so above all we're having a conversation with people so i think that this study tells us a little bit about the kind of language demands of listening to teachers in one particular context now, one major point is that the teacher talk in this study was made up mostly of the first 2,000 words of English, and high frequency vocabulary is important in written English as much, as, well, more so in spoken English than in written English. But if you don't know where to start with your learners, then the first 2,000 words of English are absolutely critical. And the reason for that is they, these words occur everywhere. Learners use them every day, or they should be. They encounter them in their speaking. They encounter them in what the teachers are saying to them. They encounter them in their text. And so I think that it's vital that one of the main take-home messages from that study is to show again that the first 2,000 words are particularly important. Okay. So that's study one, folks. Study one is done. So now I'm going to move on to study two. Study two, again, is about spoken English, but this time we were looking at the vocabulary that gets used in university tutorials and laboratory sessions, and we compared them with lectures. Now, the reason for this study was I was thinking about English for academic purposes and thinking about the kinds of vocabulary that our learners are encountering in their classrooms, and I realised that we knew quite a bit about the vocabulary size needed for listening to lectures, for example, through work by um, Yen Dang and Stuart Webb, so that's great. But actually, we figured out that actually we don't know much about those smaller group interactions that, in tutorials, and we just certainly don't know much about laboratory sessions and what happens with that language. Now, this project was a little bit... Um, how do I say this? I think not circular, but what we did was we first of all did an analysis of tutorials and labs to try and find out how many words learners need. So it's very similar in a way to that first study that I've just been talking about. But then what we did is we went and looked at English for academic purposes and English for specific purposes textbooks to find out what those textbooks told us about the language that students would encounter in those small group interactions. And then what we did is we decided to look beyond the single words to look at multi-word units. So now I'm going to take you just through those three main parts of the study just to talk about what we did in this particular study. So again, the focus here is on university level, it's on tutorials, and it's on laboratory sessions. Now, I've already talked about 95% and 98% before. And what this slide tells you is about lectures and seminars, 95% and 98%. You've got the information about general spoken discourse down the bottom, 3,000 to 6,000. And what this tells you is that in our study on tutorials and on labs, actually, 
again, you're seeing at 95%, it's around the same as general spoken discourse. So again, this is people talking to each other about normal kinds of things. Then when you look at the 98%, you can see labs, which again is sciences, you need a bigger vocabulary size of around 7,000 word family. Tutorials, not so much. They just gain a thousand words to get up to 98%. So what does that tell us? If you are working with students who are going to study in the sciences at university, then to work with the text that they're going to be listening to, so in those situations where they're working in the lab, they need a, a pretty good vocabulary science. So 3,000 will get them through the door and get them working with other people. 7,000 is gonna get them their more specialized vocabulary that they need in their, in their sciences in general. If your students are going into, tut into tutorials, so they might be art students, for example, then they don't need as big a vocabulary as they would if they were science students. And look again at lectures and seminars. So lectures and seminars, 95% is 4,000, 98% is 8,000. So actually lectures and seminars are gonna be harder for students from a vocabulary perspective than laboratory sessions and tutorials. So the first bit of our study was to just do a corpus analysis just, was to do a corpus analysis to look at how many word families learners needed to know, right? So then the second part of the study was we were looking at what do textbooks tell us about laboratory, about vocabulary that's needed in, in the laboratory sessions and in tutorials? Now, what we found was not very much, right, for a start. So out of 16 books, we found only three that said anything really about tutorials at university. Now, these are good books. I'm not saying they're not good books. I'm just saying that there's a big gap here. So we didn't find anything about laboratory sessions. So if you were teaching from these books and you had students who were gonna be going into science at university, then we've got a bit of a problem here, right? Now we did find in three textbooks, we found 176 phrases, which sounds like a lot, right? In these textbooks that were presented as being useful if you're gonna prepare for speaking in a tutorial at university. Now, what we found in the textbooks was they had these kinds of things. So agreeing or disagreeing, I, I simply disagree or I totally disagree with you. There was a bit of comprehension checking. Uh, could you please say that a little bit more slowly? Very sensible thing to teach somebody to say. Um, and then giving opinions and responding. But then when we, back, when we went back to our corpus and we looked for these 176 phrases, actually we didn't find very many of them. And we certainly didn't find, you're kidding. So then the question becomes, what did we find? when we looked in that corpus for what might be useful phrases for university level students going into these kinds of small group interactions. So what we did find is that in the tutorials and in the laboratory corpus, we, we found multi-word units. And what we did is we uh, categorized them according to their function. So what you can see on the screen is if you see stance expression, stance expression means uh, what's the position that the speaker is taking. So what we did with our stance expressions is we said what's the core multi-word expression here. So in, the, in that first example you've got don't know, right? You can see that in the middle. And what we've done is we've said to the left of don't know, we've given you the option. So it could be, I don't know, we don't know, you don't know, right? And what can be followed? So don't know what, don't know if, don't know how, for example. So the next one is a core expression of you have to, right? And then you get the, what are the options? So, so you have to, and then what you have to do. Now this is very simple instruction language, isn't it? So what you're seeing here is, the first thousand words of English or even perhaps the first 500 words of English being used in these multi-word expressions. I think the key point here is the use of high frequency vocabulary. A second key point is that this language is not full of um, lots of difficult technical or academic vocabulary. Actually, this is people talking to each other, giving instructions, trying to find out 
something, organizing the information that they're giving and doing these sorts of general things that teachers do in class all the time. Now, this is a bit tricky because what it means is that to prepare our students for going into tutorials and laboratory classes, they actually need to be able to follow what the opinion is or what the task is or what it is that the lecturer it, or the tutorial leader is trying to say, and they're actually using high-frequency vocabulary. Now, what do we know about high-frequency vocabulary? Usually, so first of all, it occurs everywhere. Secondly, it tends to occur quickly. So, and, they, and these are chunks of language. So there's a really, one of my favorites is when teachers say, do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? It goes really fast. So they don't go, do you know what I mean at all? It's all very much um, going together. It sounds almost like one chunk of language. So I think that part of this research is looking really quickly, to, sorry, looking closely at this language and then saying, what's the free, what, what are these words? What's the frequency of these words? What's happening in these chunks of language? So if we want to be teaching our students about how to take part in these kinds of spoken language events, then what they need mostly is high frequency vocabulary and they need to be learning these chunks of language so that they can hear them well, but they also need to be able to produce them. And teaching them things like you're kidding, doesn't get them anywhere in terms, I don't think, in terms of the kinds of language that they actually need. Now we did produce it for, the, for this particular study. We did produce a list of the, of the kinds of expressions and multi-word units that get used often in tutorials and laboratories sessions, and we've split them into two. So you can get the list for the tutorials and you can get the list for the laboratory sessions. And that's available if you go and find the language learning article. Oh, no, sorry, I'm lying to you. I can send you the reference, actually, for this article. Ah, oh, sorry, folks. Did I put it at the end? Oh, the reference for it, actually, is part of this PowerPoint, so that's fine. It's in the journal called English for Academic Purposes. Phew, I've got the information. Great. Okay. So I've told you so far about two studies that we've done. So one study was looking at teacher talk in the German context. Another study was looking at uh, vocabulary used in laboratory sessions and tutorials at the university level. Now the final study I want to talk about is kind of drawing these things together. And this, this study is about academic spoken vocabulary and, and you'll have no surprise if you know anything about some of the work that I've done, it's a word list. So if you haven't seen this word list, it's called the Spoken Academic Word List. Is it Academic Spoken Word List? Actually, it's the other way around. Academic Spoken Word List. Uh, again, this is Yen Dang, me, and Stuart Webb. And the whole idea with this particular research was to say, we have written word lists. Right? So we've got the academic word list, which is my work from a while ago. We've got the academic vocabulary list, which has been put together by Gardner and Davies in 2014, for example. And what we wanted to do with this work was to say, well, okay, that's great, but these things are all written on, they're all based on written academic text. What about the vocabulary and helping students with the spoken academic vocabulary that they need for their studies? So this is why this research got done. And I'm here to tell you about it again here today. Okay. So this academic spoken word list was developed by looking at different disciplines. And the, the disciplines that were uh, used in this research were hard, things, hard pure, so that's things like chemistry. Soft pure is when it's applied, so applied chemistry or applied biosciences, all, all those kinds of things. Hard applied, uh, sorry. Hard, pure, soft, pure, hard applied, and soft applied. Now, if we've got, if we've got anybody here who's uh, from the Danish system, then what you'd be talking about is wet science and dry science. So the idea with having these four disciplines was to say, what's the vocabulary that occurs across these four disciplines and in spoken academic discourse? Now, the word list itself has got 1,741 word family, so it's quite big, and it's divided into several sort of grades where it's, it's used in a way that means that students who have different proficiency levels can still use the academic spoken word list. Now, 
I think the most important thing to say about this word list is that it provides 90% coverage of an academic speaking corpus. And then when Yin Dang had got a second academic spoken corpus together, the word list also, it also performed around 90%. So remember that 95, 98% that we were talking about right at the start of this talk. If you've got a word list of 1,700 word families and it provides 90% coverage, then you're actually quite close to getting towards that 95%. That's one of the main things. The second thing is this word list actually contains quite a lot of high-frequency vocabulary, which is why you get such high coverage. Now, I don't know if you know anything much about how I made the academic word list, but what I did with the academic word list is I decided to try and uh, to not include the first 2,000 words of English because my thinking at that time was, well, if you're coming to university, then probably you already know the first 2,000 words of English. And actually, in retrospect, I was wrong. And the reason why I was wrong is because, as we know now, actually there are quite a few high-frequency words in English which are also academic words. So that's why a study like the Academic Vocabulary List by Gardner and Davies, for example, and that fabulous website called wordsandphrases.com. And that's why it's particularly important that this research um, and the work by Yen Dang here with the Academic Spoken Word List actually does contain high-frequency vocabulary from the first 2,000 words. Why? Because actually there's academic vocabulary in this um Academic vocabulary can be high frequency. That's the most important thing I wanted to say. Now, again, you see at the bottom of the screen it says that this word list is divided according to the proficiency level of the learners. So if your learners know the first thousand words of English, for example, and you, you know that because you've used the updated vocabulary levels test by Stuart Webb and colleagues, for example, then that test tells you whether your students know the first thousand words or the second thousand words or the third thousand words in English, right? So you can use that vocabulary test along with the academic spoken word list test. So you can see if they know the first thousand words of English, then we tell you in that in that article and in the work that Yen has on her website, then it says, okay, so if they know this many words in English, that's good. So start here with the academic spoken word list, or if they know only this many words in English, that's okay. What they need to do is start here in the academic spoken word list. Now, I haven't seen any other word list that uses proficiency levels of students quite in this way. Now, I've already said that this spoken word list had some really strong features. And one of them is around this whole idea of coverage, right? So depending on the proficiency levels of the students, they can get quite high coverage if they start working with the academic spoken word list. Now, what else is going to be in a corpus apart from academic spoken vocabulary? Well, what you get when you do a transcription of anybody speaking or giving a lecture is you get lots of words like um and ah and mm, and these words are called fillers, right? So they, they occur. And another thing that you get in academic spoken English is lots of potentially proper nouns. So if you have a lecturer who's speaking in the social sciences, for example, we know that they are much more likely in history in the social sciences to use many more proper nouns than in other subject areas. Excuse me. Sorry. So that it's really important to be thinking about what else might be in there apart from this academic spoken vocabulary. Does that make sense? I hope it does. So one of the ways that we could be working with texts, for example, to, to make them more comprehensible if we're doing academic listening, is if this is a text about history, for example, and it's something about New Zealand history, then I'd need to know that the students would understand that particular words from Māori or New Zealand English which might occur in the text to help them understand this text. Now, one of the key principles to think about with working with any kind of text, and this is a coordination principle, is what's the work you can do today to make the work tomorrow easier for the students? So really when we're doing this kind of work with text, we need to be thinking about what's tomorrow's text going to have in it and how can we prepare our students better for that as well as for reading today's text. And that's why we need to think about high-frequency vocabulary so that they've got a very strong foundation. They can therefore try and deal with any text that they, get, they, they start to meet because this academic vocabulary comes around again and again and again and so does high-frequency vocabulary. Now, we did some work to compare academic 
written word lists with academic spoken word lists. And this is in a chapter that Yen and, and I wrote a little while ago, and well, published this year, but we wrote last year. And that was that when we looked at the vocabulary of tutorials and laboratory tests, the academic spoken word lists had much higher coverage over those, and you know what coverage means? So that's the percentage of the text that that word list represents. So the academic spoken word list, the coverage was much higher. It was around 90% over the tutorials and laboratory text. The academic word list was much lower, it was around 3.5% coverage, and the academic vocabulary list was, was uh, maybe around 20%. So what this tells us is that the academic spoken word list is very strong over spoken academic text. So if you're preparing students for what they're going to listen to at university, then you should know about the academic spoken word list. Now we're not saying that the academic word list, my academic word list, or the academic vocabulary list is just no good. That's not true. What we're saying is these word lists were produced on written text, so they are much stronger over written text. Okay, if you want to find out more about the academic spoken word list, you can see that there's a web address there. But to be honest, you could just do a search for dang academic spoken word list and it would get there. You'd get there. It wouldn't be a problem to find it at all. And the original article for that is in, is in language learning. And I think I gave you the, yep, and you can find the reference for that as well at the back of the presentation. Okay, now I've talked about, and I've been talking now for 35 minutes, so we'll, we'll get there folks, we're not far off now. So what I've done in this talk, as I've said, there are three studies that were done on spoken academic English. One on teacher talk, and looking at how many word family students needed in English, maths, and science classes. Then we looked at tutorials and laboratory sessions in a university setting. And then we looked at what happens when you try and develop a word list of academic spoken English. And I've presented that research as well. So what I wanted to finish up with is to say, well, that's all lovely. But what does this mean in terms of um, connecting to what we're doing with our own teaching and learning? So I've got these four main points that I just really wanted to talk through now with you. So the first one is, High frequency vocabulary is really, really important. It's important for teacher talk in secondary school. It's important for all kinds of language use. Learners need the first 2,000 words of English. They need to be able to recognize them. They need to be able to use them. They need to be able to hear them. They need to be able to produce them, right? So our secondary school study, and we need to do much more of this kind of research. It's one thing to say, well, this is one. These are, these are a couple of teachers in Germany. I want to find out more about teacher talk in this New Zealand context, for example. So what is it teachers are saying? And we're not saying that this is bad. What we're saying is it's full of high-frequency vocabulary. Actually, that's great, because that's what we use in general conversation. It's, it's really important that learners have that strong control over those first 2,000 words of English. Now, if your students are going into the into university level study and they're going to be going into tutorials and they're going to be going into laboratory sessions, they need roughly double that amount. So they need the first 4,000 words of English. So this is telling us more about the kinds of specific goals that our learners need to be working towards. The next thing is around multi-word units. And again, we need much more research in this area. Now, if you know about the academic formulas list, that's a particularly useful list for you to have a little think about as well, and that's by Simpson, Black, and Ellis. So the best person to look for online is Professor Nick Ellis at Michigan State University. And they're working with the Michigan Corpora, and what they did is they discovered, they, they looked at Corpora and they talked with teachers and testers, and they said, we've found these academic formulas. I think there are uh, shared formulas between writing and speaking. And formulas just for speaking and formulas just for re for writing. And I think you might find that particularly useful as well. So we've done a bit of work on interaction and speaking skills and multi-word units. We actually need to do more work on that. And they've done some work on academic formulas that you need. And there's a new article out by Lei and Liu as well on multi-word units and academic speaking. So if you want to find out more about that, there are there's more and more being published now, which is good. 
Yen Dang has also written on vocabulary and speaking in the hard sciences and in the soft sciences, and I've included the reference there for you as well. I think this work is really important because it's not small stuff to create an academic spoken corpus, and it's not small stuff to do the research behind trying to find out more about what language gets used. And it's exciting for me to talk about it with you all today because I think that you can see that this work should be pretty useful for teachers and learners in the future. I've also talked about the academic spoken word list and how important I think it is for our teachers and learners. It has a high coverage of academic spoken text. Right, so I'm going to start wrapping up. So when we think about teaching and learning and approaches to learning, if you were sitting next to me or in a class right now, I'd be getting you to have a talk about these kinds of questions. So I thought I'd put them all up on the screen. So what I wanted to say was, do our courses or our texts explicitly focus on vocabulary in an organized way? So in other words, in your classes and in your textbooks and in what you do as a teacher, do you actually talk with your learners about vocabulary? If you do, what do you talk about with them around vocabulary? Probably you talk about the meaning of a word I've been talking here about spoken academic English and the, the, um, the kinds of vocabulary knowledge that you need, the size of the vocabulary that you need. So talking with your learners about how big a vocabulary they need in order to carry out these tasks, like listening to a lecture, like uh, taking part in a tutorial. These kinds of um, tasks need to, be, they need to be part of what we're talking about when we're thinking about vocabulary in our classrooms. So in other words, understanding the size of the goal, understanding the types of tasks that they need to be able to do, and understanding how big their vocabulary size is now, for example, or do they know the first thousand words of English? I think that that's particularly important because it gives them a strong baseline of understanding what their jobs are in terms of learning vocabulary. The second thing is to talk about both single words and multi-word units when we're talking about English for academic purposes in our classroom and vocabulary use in speaking. So we've done some work in this area. There's much, much more to be done. I've just been doing some work on, uh, believe it or not, but the vocabulary of plumbing and carpentry in a new book, which is called English for Vocational Purposes. And what we did in that research is we recorded plumbing tutors and carpentry tutors, for example, teaching students and looking to see what they did and what these tutors did in order to explain these te heavily technical words, for example, in their everyday uh, classroom approaches. It's the noisiest work I've ever done as a researcher because building sites are noisy places. So we've been looking in, the, in that particular study, we looked at single words and the technical vocabulary, and now I'm working on the multi-word units as well. So when you're looking and you're thinking about your vocabulary and what you're doing in class, are there ways that you could be drawing attention to multi-word units that are academic in nature, that are used in speaking in English for academic purposes? So you could be using the work that we did with Yen Dang and me, for example, in tutorials and uh, laboratory sessions, for example. You could be looking at um, Nick Ellis's work with academic formulas. We've got more work happening here, folks. And one of the purposes for giving talks like this is to try and find out what teachers think about this kind of work and what else we need to be doing to help out. Now, another major point is, do we assess vocabulary in speaking? And if we do, what are we assessing? So one of the things I worry about is things like, oh, these students didn't use many words from the academic word list in their presentation. But actually, if you look at the research that we're doing, you don't see much evidence of academic wordless words, for example, in these um, spoken academic texts. Why? Because actually people aren't using those kinds of words. They're using much more everyday kinds of words and they're using words which are also in the academic spoken word list. I hope that that makes sense. So when we're thinking about assessing vocabulary and speaking, we have to really think carefully about what it is we expect learners to be saying themselves and have they heard it in input. The final thing I wanted to talk about is nations four strands. And one of the reasons why I'm, I constantly mention this framework is because I think it's really important as a way of thinking about vocabulary development. So what Paul Nation says with his four strands is learners need roughly equal amounts of the following four things. So meaning-focused input is when they get lots of input for listening and reading, and it should represent 25% of what they're doing in class. Right? 
Now, if we think about academic speaking, for example, how much academic speaking do they actually get exposed to in terms of listening to lectures, listening and trying to understand what's being said? Now, in meaning-focused input, they focus on the meaning of what is being said. They're not focused on the meaning of the vocabulary and individual items, okay? Now, the opposite of meaning-focused input is meaning-focused output. So, obviously, that's going to be using language in a meaning-focused way in their writing and in their speaking. So, one of the things that we could be doing in class is thinking about how much speaking learners actually do on academic topics and talking about academic ideas for example, so do you get them, for example, to listen to a lecture and then try and retell some of the main ideas, for example? We did some work on TED Talks as input and trying to find out more about the use of vocabulary in those texts. And what we found out in our TED Talks analysis was that actually TED Talks are more like written texts than spoken texts. And they contain far more technical vocabulary, for example, and they, you need more word family members to understand a TED Talk. But the great thing about TED Talks is there's a lot more happening on the screen, for example, to help our learners to understand what's going on. So those first two strands are input and output, lots of them, 25%, that's 50% of the instruction. Language focus instruction is when you start to look at things like how is a word pronounced, for example. Uh, <clears throat> what are the words that go alongside or are collocations of this word? What are the common phrases this word occurs in, for example? How's it spelled? How's it written? The final one is fluency. And I think this is when I think about my own language teaching, fluency is where I constantly fall down. So fluency is when students are practicing for 25% of their time on understanding things and understanding them well. And in fluency, everything is, everything is known to the learner. So they're either speaking, trying to explain their ideas with fluency, or they're listening to something they're, they're very familiar with and they're getting fluency practice through that, or they're writing, doing something like a quick write exercise where everything is known to them and they're just focused on getting these ideas out and getting them on the paper. So fluency is not just fluency in speaking, it's fluency in listening and in writing and reading as well. And that's where you get programs like speed reading activities, for example, to try and increase the speed of what learners are, how fast they can read. Now, all of these things are vital for vocabulary development. So if you think about your programs and you think, well, I'm focused on academic speaking. Averill said that there's, you know, we know that we need the first 2,000 words of English. Then we need to be thinking about what kind of input we're getting our learners to listen to. <clears throat> Is it academic in nature? What kind of output? What are they speaking about? How often are they speaking in class? And then... Is my program mostly language-focused instruction, or actually do I get some language, some frequency, fluency work in there as well? So you can see this whole idea of the four strands is to get you to think about how vocabulary is working in, in input and output and this language-focused instruction, and then trying to get, get the fluency elements going. Because unless they have fluency in the first 2,000 words of English, they're really going to struggle in classes, and they're going to struggle to hear what the teachers are actually talking about. So can we use Nation's four strands? I think we can. And I think that they're really important to think about what we're doing in our classes as teachers. Now, you've been brave souls and you've been listening to me. I hope the sound quality has been okay. So what I'd like to say is thank you for listening to me talk about the kinds of research we do here in New Zealand, um, looking at English for academic purposes. But we also have more an international outreach as well with these things like German international school, school for example. So, and now work in middle schools in the States. So I'd like to say kia ora, thank you very much, nā mihi nui from here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Now, from what I understand, Simon's now going to collate some questions and then come back to me. And I think my role is just to wait to see what kind of questions are coming up. So thank you very much. I hope that you've enjoyed this. It's very strange not seeing you, but I'm so glad that you've joined me from all over the world to listen to this. It's now quarter to 11 at night, so it's nearly past my bedtime. So I'll wait for some questions now. Thanks, folks. Hi there, Avril. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks thanks a lot for that. Um, yeah, there was several, lots of questions coming in. Let me just pick on a few. Um, ju just to pick up on, on one point, actually, at the start, there's lots of people asking about the certificates. Um, if you go into the handout section, you should be able to click on the PDF of that and then fill in your name and then just print that out. And it, it is signed. 
Um, but we will also send that through to you by email in a couple of days time and um, you'll be able to watch, there'll be a link to this to, to watch again and a link to the certificate this way. Um, somebody said, how do you know our emails? Well, when you registered, you, you'd have to put that in as well. So don't worry, we know all your emails and then we'll email you with that link. Um, okay, so back to the webinar. Thank you for that. Um, just a few quick questions here. If you have any other further questions, please please do write them in now. That's great. Um, I think lots of people asking about the links to, I don't know if you could uh, get back to that screen, um, the links to the academic um, word list or lists that you, oh. were, um, that you were talking about, sure. if you could back to that one um another quick question is yeah. um yeah i think there's the, the one there at the bottom isn't it yeah if we yeah, just probably exactly. leave that on then people can see that that's great sure. um w just somebody again wanting to re recap what, what's lexical coverage again in a very brief way <laughs> so what lexical coverage is is saying if you're thinking about frequency then what we're doing is we're saying if you take um a text then a lexical frequency analysis tells you how many word families learners need to understand 95% of the text or 98% of the text. And 95% means they need help, 98% means they should be able to understand on their own. So the key thing there is learners need to know most, and, and not just most, they need to know 95% of the words in any text in order to understand it. If there are more words than, uh, if, so if they only understand 60% of the words in a text, then actually that text is far too difficult for them. So this whole idea of lexical coverage is to try and get us to engage with the text that we're using and putting in front of the students or what we're trying to say to the students to try and match more um, using text that they can understand better. Now we use lexical coverage as well with word lists. So you can see on the screen it says the academic spoken word list may allow learners to reach 92 to 96% coverage of English, academic spoken English. We know that because we took the academic spoken word list and we ran it over two corpora of academic spoken English just to check what coverage that list has over that corpus. I hope that makes sense. So how many word families exist in this text and how much does this word list cover of that text? About like that. I hope so. Okay, great. Thank you. And and just another recap on something you mentioned as well. Somebody's asking about, oh. can you cl clarify what you meant by soft, pure, hard, pure, soft, applied, oh, hard, yeah. applied? Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Okay, so what I understand of this is you get soft subjects and hard subjects. Hard subjects, and this doesn't mean as in hard as in difficult, but it's um, subjects like chemistry and biology and the sciences, they're considered to be hard subjects. Soft subjects are things like applied linguistics, my discipline, education might be another. So these are more art-based subjects. And then when you get the applied part of it, then what you're talking about there is um, taking the hard science and then applying it in some way. So you get, for example, uh, linguistics would be, um, it's a soft science and then it's applied to Applied linguistics, which is the work that I do. So we take linguistic findings and we put, apply them to teaching language and learning. So it's a way of organising disciplines within a university. Thank you. Excellent. And another question is, um, yeah, what? I'll put this one to you actually. Um, what? Hmm. What's the best way to learn academic slash more complicated words? <laughs> Do you have a, a way of doing that or a suggestion of how you can learn the more complicated uh, vocabulary? Yeah. So there are a couple of things to talk about here. So one is thinking about, uh, so what Paul Nation would say is it's not the first meeting with a word that's important. It's all the other meetings with words after that one. So frequency of encounter is really, really important. So one of the difficulties with academic vocabulary is if learners don't encounter these words very often, then you don't develop and they don't develop a memory for it. So, <clears throat> so when you've got uh, long words which are complicated and maybe Greek or Latin, you can do a couple of things. You can break words down into word parts. 
So you get words like pseudoscience. So you can say, well, okay, pseudo means what, and then science means what, and then get them to to see where they can see the breaks in the words and to learn word parts like semi or auto or uh, demi or all those kinds of um, small words um, in those things. So help them break down these long words if you can. So we've got two things there. You've got frequency. So they need to, in order to learn a word, they're going to need to encounter them multiple times. And in the research, it's anything up to 16 times. Uh, <clears throat> more often in the beginning is particularly important. So it's like trying to remember a phone number. You need some sort of a phonic loop going so that you try and remember what that phone number in your short-term memory. And what you're trying to do is to take a word from short-term memory to long-term memory so learners um, feel comfortable with using those words. The research that I did in using vocabulary in writing suggests that learners, and this has also been found by um, David Corson, may he rest in peace, who was an Australian working in Canada. And what he said is that there's a, there's a lexical bar with vocabulary. And that is that if you are going into university, but you don't have much exposure to, to academic language at all, then you're going to start hitting the problem where this language only really happens in school and it doesn't happen at home, for example. So you really need to be thinking about if you only have this precious amount of time with students and that's the only exposure they get, then you really need a framework of something like the four strands, for example, to try and help you with getting them to build their memory, getting them to use the vocabulary in context, getting them to encounter the words in context and then trying to get them to use these words more fluently. Um, and that's why we've got word lists, for example, to try and guide um, or, or to show what kinds of words get, get used often in text. So I would, a uh, very simple idea that I often used to use in class was a vocab box, and that was just simply using vocabulary cards that we all put together at the end of class. And at the end of a couple of, um, no, at the end of 12 weeks, we usually had nearly a 1,000 words in the card box. And students all learnt those words and they used to do activities and all kinds of things and their own independent learning in class and we had the meaning on one side and the spelling and the and the pronunciation on the other, for example, in common collocations. And that activity, you know it was successful because at the end of every particular course, um, somebody would steal all the words out of the box. So I'd say that that's the most successful thing that you could do if you were a language teacher. That's good. Uh, no, I like to track those people down. <laughs> <laughs> I like that tip. Another question here. You mentioned the vocabulary should be taught in an organised way. Can you elaborate what you mean by an organised way? Yeah. So, so this is really thinking about some ideas that were put forward by uh, Stuart Webb and Anna Chang, <clears throat> and they're talking about planning for vocabulary in class. So we know that high frequency vocabulary is the best vocabulary for learners to focus on first. And the reason why it's important is because it occurs all of the time. Learners need it for everything that they listen to. They need it for everything that they read. But we've got to be organized about it. So, so we know that if you get the first thousand words of English, the first 500 are going to be much more frequent than the second 500, right? And that's true right throughout English. It's just the way it is. So words like I and me and you and they and all of those kinds of words, they're really, really frequent in English. And then the frequency drops down from there. So the reason why word, word lists can be really important is because they show you which words out of all of the words in academic discourse, for example, which words occur more frequently than other ones. So if you're thinking about getting organized, then what you would do is to look, for example, at word lists or look at the text that the students are expected to read and then um, start with the most frequent words that students are going to be encountering first. And then being organised about it is to say, first of all, which are the words that are the most important for my students and why? Are they important for today? Are they important for tomorrow? If I'm going to be working with this class on this particular set of words, for example, and, and that using a four strands thing, then I'm going to make sure that the student, <clears throat> sorry, that the teacher who takes over this class next year doesn't just teach them all the same stuff all over again. That there's going to be something organized between your, your, in your schools, for example, to say, so how, what are you focusing on and why are you focusing on those things? And then what am I doing and how am I working with these words? So that we're not getting lots of repetition's good, but repetition can be deadly as well, right? 
And if you're talking about being organized around um, teaching and science vocabulary, for example, then you could be taking a look at the science specific vocabulary word list that I made a few years ago, and then seeing whether or not that's a useful resource for you. So there are websites which can help you with analyzing text using word lists. And a good example is one that's um, based on the academic word list, for example, which is called the AWL Gap Maker or the AWL Highlighter. And all that does is just you, you upload your text and it'll highlight words from the academic word list in that text. So you can see which words are being used more often, um, which words are particularly important for this text. And then you can look at the academic word list as well and say, well, in the frequency levels of that academic word list, where, where are these words that I think my students need the most? So you could be checking them to say, Here's the first thousand, uh, no, here are the first hundred words of the academic word list. Which of these words do you know? Do you recognize? You'd be amazed how honest the students are about, yeah, this word I know, no, that one really I don't know. You could be using what they tell you as well to get feedback on the kinds of words that they need. So we're not, so it's not random. It's not, oh, here's a word that I think is important, you know, triplet. I'm going to teach you that word. Why? You know, why are we doing that? So we're looking at the kind of research evidence to try and help teachers and students with this idea. Okay, I'll just thank you for that. I'll just end up very, very, thank you. Very, very, very quickly, last one, because I think this is a great question. Could you give us some examples of authentic vocabulary learning activities that we can do in class? Ooh. There's some sort of authentic, I don't know, I know. It's, a good, it's a good question. Okay. Um, okay. I don't know if you have an answer for that. Authentic is tricky, hey. So what are you talking about there? So, um, if we suspend reality and we say, okay, so we're all sitting in this classroom and we're all, I mean, this is this is not a normal kind of a situation, is it? But anyway, so we're here and we're doing authentic vocabulary learning. Then what I'd be looking for is um, opportunities to focus on the meaning of words to get repetition of key words, to get learners using words in their speaking and in their reading uh, and encountering them in the reading. So I would be using activities, for example, like a poster carousel session where students uh, read an article and then they have to like, they go into a conference so they read it they read an article or something from a newspaper or something and then they prepare a presentation or buy like a poster or a PowerPoint presentation where they talk about the main points and they try and use the, the key vocabulary that they've found which is new and they think is really important for understanding that text and they put it into a PowerPoint presentation with the key points and then they give their presentation to other students who are who are in an audience, or you, you could do it like a poster carousel, so people are going around like in a in a in a conference where you'd you'd go and so Simon's giving a talk, and I go and listen to Simon give his talk about the article that he read, and then I ask him questions. So what we're doing is we're engaging in meaning, right? So he's explaining something, and he's we're focused on the meaning. Of, I'm focused on the meaning of what he's saying. And I'm asking him questions, and the vocabulary is all key to that particular activity as well. So Simon's explaining key things as they come up. Then my task as a listener is to go off and listen to somebody else, also giving their presentation. And then after a little while, I'll give my presentation as well. So what we've got there is fluency going on as well, because you've got multiple presentations. And I know you're going to stop me. I want to say <laughs> something else. And that is thank you to Cambridge University Press for inviting me to come and talk to you today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, that really is all we have time for. Um, thank you, everybody that's attended. Thank you so much. I know there's a number of questions. There's an, a number of points that you've raised throughout. We we can't get through all of them. Um, there is an opportunity to, to, to come back again later today. And if, if, if time allows, if you